the doctrine of Jezebel. Now, I could subtitle this message tonight, The Terrible Danger of Being Seduced by a False Doctrine. Listen to what Jesus is saying. I have a few things against you because you suffer and or you permit that woman Jezebel, which calls herself a prophetess, to teach and seduce my servants to commit fornication and eat things sacrificed unto idols. Now look this way, please. The Greek word for Jezebel here is a synonym which means false doctrine. That's what Jesus is. In fact, Jezebel, the Old Testament, epitomizes. She became a synonym in the New Testament for all false doctrine. When you see Jezebel in the New Testament, we're talking about false heathenish doctrines that are creeping into the church of Jesus Christ. Look at that. As many as have not this doctrine. He's talking about Jezebel as being a false doctrine. Now, here's a group of people. These are people that are children of God. And the scripture says they're full of charity and good works. And they're patient. But you see the eyes of Jesus suddenly appearing. Eyes like a flame of fire. And his feet are like fine brass. He's walked out of a fire. And his feet are brilliant brass. His eyes are ablaze. Now, why are the eyes of Jesus ablaze? Now, remember, John is the one who wrote this. He was the one who laid his head upon the bosom of Jesus. And he was that beloved one. But now John, in his vision here, doesn't even recognize this man. He falls as a dead man before him. His eyes are blazing. The very one he laid his head on, his bosom upon. Now he sees him coming to the church. And his eyes are on fire. There's something terribly wrong in this church. And I, I believe with all of my heart he's speaking to the church of Jesus Christ today. Jesus is not just talking to about a little group in Tyre, Tyre in Asia. He's talking about what he sees down through the church ages until his very coming. He said they're going, there's going to be something creep into the church, and it was there at the time. And this is a message. He said there's something happening, and I'm going to send judgment upon this church, and I'm going to make an example to all the churches. You read it right there so that all the churches will understand. Now what's happened? There's certain members of this church that are actually in spite of their good works, in spite of their charity, in spite of their patience, are selling out to the devil. They're absolutely being sold out to the devil. They are under the seduction of a false doctrine. They're under the spell of a false teaching. A teaching that came to them disguised as the Holy Word of God, but in fact is of Satan himself. And this is very alarming to me, and that's why God's put this on my heart. There's a seduction of the servants of God here. In fact, God himself, or Christ himself is saying, my servants, seducing my servants. This is first and foremost a seduction first of the ministry, of pastors, teachers, and evangelists. And friends, I believe we've come to that very day in the church right now, when God, or Christ is coming with his eyes ablaze, he sees what he saw in the church at Thyatira, this dire, dire condition is in the church right now. A church doing good works. A church speaking much about faith. A church willing to give itself in charitable works. But he said, I've got something against you. You're permitting something in your midst. You're not dealing with the seduction that's crept in. You're letting it go on. And I'm telling you, I can't do that tonight as a servant of God, having seen what I've seen in the Spirit. I cannot stand by on the judgment day and have Jesus say, you suffered Jezebel in your church. You suffered to say nothing. You wouldn't say anything about the seduction in my house. I can't do that. These seduced teachers, the Bible said, were producing children of seduction, children of fornication. He said, I'm going to cast you and your children into a bed. And this is exactly what's happening. The teaching of spiritual fornication has become the main attraction of the church in many sections. Now, I'm not painting this brush. I'm not painting everybody with this brush. I'm talking about what I see arising in the church. And I want to say in no uncertain terms tonight, it's dangerous, critically dangerous to sit under false teaching. 
false teachers and false preachers and false doctrine are sending more people to hell than all the drug pushers and all the pimps and prostitutes on the face of the earth. Multitudes of blind Christians are going to churches and singing and shouting and praising the Lord in churches that are enslaved by false doctrine and they don't even know it. Thousands are sitting under this and they're having this gospel poured into them. In fact, they're so blind they're going out saying, isn't it wonderful? Isn't it glorious? And they're blind that they're sitting under a false, completely false doctrine. Now, Christ doesn't take this matter lightly. Otherwise, his eyes wouldn't be on fire. And he comes to warn and to expose to save his people from seduction. And you and I better get serious about it. And I'm telling you now, it is serious about where you go to church. But you know, it's serious where you go to church. It's serious the kind of message that you sit under. It's serious the kind of teaching that has your heart. Now, the mark of a seduced Christian is that he's always carried about. He's seeking some new, different, strange kind of teaching. He's always looking for that which tickles the ear. The Bible warns, be not carried about with different and strange doctrines. Hebrews 13, 9. Now that means in Greek, don't be driven thither and yon. Don't be carried place to place, from place to place. Now, this means... I'm talking about the Christian gadabouts, the spiritual tumbleweeds who are carried around by all the winds and waves of doctrine in the land today. They don't land anywhere. They don't land anywhere. They're always tumbling, they're moving with every wind and wave of doctrine that comes along. They have no roots. Their ears are always striving to hear something new, something sensational, something entertaining, pleasing to the flesh. They're like the Athenians that Paul preached to, who spent their whole time in nothing else, the Bible said, but either to tell or to hear some new thing. In fact, Paul warned Timothy, he said, the day is coming when they will not endure sound doctrine. And brother, sister, there, there's not a mistake there when it says endure sound doctrine. That means just what it was. They want to stay until God exposes it. They don't want that. They will not endure sound doctrine. But after their own lust, they will heap to themselves teachers having itching ears. They'll, they'll have heaps of teachers that go around just preaching their soothing message and scratching their itching ears. And the mark of a true mature Christian is that he is not tossed to and fro by every wind and wave of doctrine, but he has roots. He's already got his feet under the table. He's already been led into green pasture. He or she is not fooled by all of the false doctrines that come along. And when you walk in that purity before the Lord, you can smell it a mile away. You can sense it and you can just sit there. Within five minutes, you can turn to your husband and wife and your friends say, uh-uh, something's wrong. There's a sound that's not right. The Holy Ghost will bear it to your heart. You'll know it. You don't have to have somebody else tell you. You don't have to study books to tell you whether it's right or wrong. The Holy Ghost is there and he tells you, this is wrong. This does not ring true. Oh, I, I was in a meeting in, in Texas one time a number of years ago and everybody was flocking to hear this man. I sat in the balcony, hundreds and hundreds were there and, and it looked all right, but he, he hadn't been speaking three minutes I grabbed my stomach and I grabbed Gwen and she's here. She felt the same thing. I said, honey, I'm sick. Hold me. I'm about to get up and rebuke this man. Th this man is full of the devil himself. This man is satanic. And all those assembly God people sitting there clapping and carried up in that. And that man was telling one big lie after another. Nothing but lies. Terrible lies. Horrible lies. And I had to hold on and I got up. And I was going out and I was pale and my wife was sick and everybody was rave, raving and one of my one of my friends came up to me and said, Who Wilkerson, what do you think? I said, just let me out of here. Just let me out of here. I wanted to vomit. I wanted to vomit. It was so terrible and I went on weeping that there were so many blind Christians. Blind! The mark of a mature believer is found in Ephesians, Ephesians 4. Please follow me tonight. Let's go into the Word of God. Ephesians, the fourth chapter. You told me you loved the Word, didn't you? Well, let's start verse 13. Till we all come in the unity of the faith and the knowledge of the Son of God 
unto a perfect man to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, that we henceforth, or from now on, be no more children, tossed to and fro, and carried about with every wind of doctrine, by the slight of men, and cunning craftiness, whereby they lie in wait to deceive, but speaking the truth in love, may grow up into him in all things which is the head, even to Christ. Look at me now, please. Do you see that? Do you see that? The mature are not tossed to and fro. When you hear, hey, you ought to go hear this man. You ought to hear this woman. Ask a few questions. Are people repenting? Are people falling before God and are sins being exposed? Ask a few questions before you go. Now, there are only two doctrines according to the Word of God. There's the doctrine of Jesus Christ and there's the doctrine of Jezebel. And we're going to talk about both of them tonight. Chapter 2, Titus, second chapter, verse 10. Not purloining with stealing, not stealing, but showing all good fidelity that they may adorn what? The doctrine of God our Savior in all things. There you have the doctrine of Jesus Christ laid before us. If you want to know whether, and the whole purpose of this message is to find out whether you, now you may be a visitor here tonight, and I think if you've been coming to Titus Square Church, you have every right to judge us by the Word of God. You have, you must judge us by the Word of God. I, I want to find out tonight, and I want you to listen closely and let the Holy Spirit speak clearly to your heart. Let's find out whether or not you're sitting under a false teacher. Let's find out if you're sitting under a false gospel. There's no doubt about it. You don't have to be in the dark about it. Nothing can be clear in all the Word of God. First of all, the true doctrine of Jesus Christ is a doctrine that teaches the denial of all ungodliness and worldly lust in this life. Not just in eternity, but here and now. Verse 11. Titus 2.11 For the grace of God that, a, that bringeth salvation hath appeared to all men. And what does the doctrine of the Lord Jesus Christ teach us? Teaching us that what denying ungodliness and worldly lust we should live soberly righteously and godly in this present world looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior Jesus Christ who gave himself for us that he might redeem us from what all iniquity and do what purify himself a peculiar people, zealous of good works, these things speak. What does the doctrine of Jesus speak? What do true prophets of God speak? These things speak and exhort and rebuke with all authority. Let no man despise thee. Is that in your Bible? Now let me ask you a question. Look at me, please. The church you go to, and I'm not running down your church, I'm not going to name it, I don't even know what church you go to, I'm speaking Bible principles. When you go there, do you just leave feeling good? You feel happy? Has your pastor stood in all spiritual authority? And has he asked the Holy Spirit to come in and probe you to the very depths? Has he stood there with a broken heart and, and said to himself, and you can hear it in his words, I'll not let you go out that door carrying your sins with you? I, you may get angry at me. You may leave me. But I will say to you in tears, that God has called us to preach a word that brings forth a godly response. He's here to purify himself a holy people. And the message of the grace of God is that the grace of God has been sent to teach us how to deny ungodliness and worldly lust, to live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world. And I want to tell you, if you're going to church, and you can hide your sins, and you can walk out, and go right to your idols without feeling uncomfortable about it. You better watch out. You better watch out. Because it's going to get easier and easier to hide more sins than that. You're going to allow it to add idol upon idol until finally you'll not feel the conviction. You'll know to hear a word that will bring the conviction. The scripture says, let us cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of flesh and spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. That's the teaching. And we're to rebuke with all authority. God has given me the right, as one who wants to walk before him in purity, to stand here tonight with all spiritual authority, not to lord it over you, not to beat you to the ground, but to come with a broken heart 
and say that God is going to have a New York City of holy people. If he has to go out, bypass every church and go out and get drug addicts and alcoholics off the street, God's going to raise up a holy people in this city. You, you say, are you mad, David? No, I'm not. I, I, other than at the devil. I, I have people call us and write to our office. And we had it this past week. And people write to us and say, and, and they're broken heart. They say, Brother Dave, our pastor, and this is in Pentecostal churches. Our pastor gets up and he keeps saying, I'm not here to preach against sin. I'm here to lift up Jesus. Well, how else do you lift up Jesus but getting the sin out so you can lift holy hands to him? There are two extremes. You see, you have the preacher who gets up and he thunders that, that sadist message at people. And he's he just cutting people. It's, it's harsh. It's cold. It's legalistic. It drives you to good works only. And that's not what God wants. That's as bad as the other side. And the other side is to stand up and preach like a coward. Afraid to hurt anybody in the congregation. Afraid to preach the truth because of losing some money or support in the church. Or, a, I have people write to us and say, well, Brother Dave, I, I hear you preach against this prosperity message, but you know, my, my preacher preached prosperity, but he preaches against sin. He names it every once in a while. Every once in a while I hear him say holiness. He uses those terms, holiness. Yes, the terms are there. The words are right. I'm not talking about using the terms. I'm not talking about words. I'm talking about what the Holy Ghost produces in you as a result of those words. First Timothy 6 chapter. The doctrine of Jesus Christ is built around the preaching of holiness and godliness. All right, look at verse 3 and 4. If any man, if any teacher, any pastor, any evangelist, if anyone teaches otherwise and consent not to wholesome words, even the words of our Lord Jesus Christ, and to the doctrine which is according to godliness, he is what? And he knows what? Then why are you listening to him? I'm not being facetious. This is life and death. He's proud. He knows nothing, but he, but he's doting about questions and strife of words, whereby come envy, strife, and railings, and evil surmisings, perverse disputings of men of corrupt minds and destitute of the truth, supposing that gain is godliness. From such do what? I didn't hear you. Withdraw thyself. From any teaching, any doctrine that teaches you that gain is godliness. In other words, if you're being blessed, you're holy. You're being blessed, you're pure. I can show you some of the most atheistic churches in America that are rich. I can show you Christians who live in total depravity who are rich. But teaching that gain is godliness from such, turn away, withdraw yourself. Now, let me get to the doctrine of Jezebel because that's the heart of my message. The doctrine of Jezebel, and we're going to talk about this doctrine of demons that's sweeping into the church. And there are three distinct marks of the Jezebel doctrine. In fact, Jezebel embodies this whole thing, this doctrine embodied in what Jesus is saying in Revelation uh, chapter 2 to the church of Thyatira. All right, give me your very good ear now. First of all, the doctrine of Jezebel is a doctrine which teaches something evil can be good. Something evil can be good. It teaches that something profane can be sanctified and made pure. And I'm going to base my message tonight on this doctrine where it started with Jezebel in the Old Testament. So it was 1 Kings, 1 Kings 16th chapter. Oh, I love the Word of God, don't you? Uh, I'll tell you what, I see it there in black and white, I believe it. But it's right there, it jumps out of the pages. Now we're going to go back to the Old Testament and see Jezebel in her Old Testament seduction, which embodies the New Testament seduction as well. 16th chapter, 1 Kings. We're going to go to verse 30. We're going to introduce you to two characters, Ahab and his wife Jezebel. Verse 30. And Ahab, the son of Omri, did evil in the sight of the Lord above all that were before him. And it came to pass, as if it had been a light thing for him to walk in the sins of Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, that he took to wife Jezebel, the daughter of Ethbel, king of the Zidonians, and went and served Baal and worshipped him. Right. Jezebel, in Hebrew, now remember in Greek, in the New Testament, she represents a synonym 
or another name for false doctrine. In the Hebrew, her name means chaste or pure virgin. Can you imagine the most wicked woman on earth, an adulteress, a seductress, a murderer, has a name called purity, chastity, virgin. But it's with a question mark. In the Hebrew, it has a question mark, when, where, and how. In other words, how did she become suddenly holy? How did she become pure? Why? How, why would you call this woman pure? How could you call her pure? And that's what, that's what a question I ask right now. The Holy Ghost has put a great big question mark there. Now, Ahab in Hebrew means one just like his father. He was like his father, the devil. He, this man was bound by every power of Satan there could possibly be released on a human being. Now, Jezebel represents false doctrine. Ahab represents the victim of false doctrine. Now, keep that in mind as we go on. Jezebel, the Bible states... Now, I, I want you to see this very clearly. When you embrace a sin, if you're going to hold on to something in your life, the next step is to embrace a doctrine that will justify it. Did you hear me? God said, it's not enough, Ahab, that you had this sin, you had this thing in you, this secret thing in you. It's not enough that your heart was like your father. It's not enough that you're going after some desire in your heart that you won't lay down. But you've got to marry Jezebel on top of it. No, it's not enough. And the spiritual analogy is this. It's not enough that you won't lay down that secret sin that the Holy Ghost has talked to you about. It's not enough that materialism has gripped your heart. It's not enough that you're bound by these things that you covet. You're going to run after a doctrine. You're going to go to bed, so to speak, with a doctrine that justifies your actions. And it came to pass as he'd been the light thing for him to walk in the sins of Jeroboam, he took to wife Jezebel. The tendency of Christians that hold on to their lust is to run after these. Now, the last thing Ahab needed in his life was a Jezebel. What Ahab needed was a Nathan. When David sinned with Bathsheba, he didn't need a happy-go-lucky positive preacher coming along and patting him on the back and saying, you can make it. You're all right. No, he needed a bony finger of Nathan and said, you're the man. You're the man. And if you've got sin in your heart and covetous, is what you need. It's not some positive thinker coming along telling you you can make it and go for it. You need a Holy Ghost prophet that says, stop. Amen. The Bible says there was none like Ahab who did sell himself to work wickedness in the sight of the Lord, whom Jezebel, his wife, stirred up. And here's the message. Here it is. You will find a doctor that will stir up these longings. There will come a doctrine along that will magnify every sin in your heart. If it's there, you will finally move around, toss to and fro, falling every wind and wave of doctrine till you sit down and say, Aha! That sounds good. Those who preach the doctrine of Christ have called to show people the difference between the evil and the good. You don't have to turn there, but Ezekiel 44, 23 says, and they, speaking of the holy prophets of God, and they shall teach my people the difference between the holy and the profane and will cause them to discern between the clean and the unclean. Wouldn't you say that's the job of a true shepherd? To show the people in the congregation, first have the Holy Ghost show it to him and then show it to the congregation the difference between what is clean and what is unclean? Uh, you don't think there's a conspiracy in the church today? Oh, brother, sister, you better hear the word of the Lord. Ezekiel 22, verse 25. There's a what? There's conspiracy of her prophets in the midst thereof. Like a roaring, what's, what's the New American Standard say? There's a roaring lion. Same thing. That's the devil. There's a roaring lion. There's a conspiracy of her prophets in the midst thereof. Like a roaring lion ravening the prey. They have devoured souls. They've taken the treasure and precious things. And they've made her many widows in the midst thereof. Her priest have violated my law and have profaned my holy things. They put no difference between the...
Neither they show difference between the unclean and the clean, and they've hid their eyes from my Sabbath, and I'm profaned among them. Their princes in the midst thereof are like wolves ravening, the prey to shed blood and to destroy souls to get dishonest gain. Verse 28, and their prophets have daubed them with untempered mortar, saying vanity and divining lies unto them, saying, Thus saith the Lord when the Lord hath not spoken. Isn't that frightening? Listen to the doctrine very closely now. The doctrine of Jezebel, secondly, first of all, it, it, it calls evil good and good evil. It's got it all mixed up. Secondly, the doctrine of Jezebel promotes covetousness. This tape goes out all over the world, and, I, uh, and, and I, I've got to say it, and I want to say it in all the love Jesus can give me. Yes, and I'm going to take the strongest stand I've ever taken in my life against the prosperity preaching right here now. And you can't get mad at me, I'm going to give you the word. And I tell you, I say it in broken heart, I say it in love. I'm not preaching against men. There's some men that are preaching this that are just in blindness. And one of these days, if you pray for them, hold on, they'll come out of it. And if they don't, then they're going to spin off into everything we're talking about tonight. Lord, sanctify me to say it with love. And listen good. Here's the doctrine of Jezebel. Aren't you king? Aren't you somebody? You're number one. You have the rights of the kingdom. They belong to you. Don't let anything stop you from getting it. You know what she said? Hey, if you go your way. You be merry, be happy, be glad. I'll get it for you. And I want to tell you that for centuries, the church of Jesus Christ has been preaching of the sufferings of the Lord Jesus Christ that we're to fill up. Jesus has said, if you walk with me, you're going to suffer in this world. He said, deny yourself and take up your cross and follow me. If any man love the world and the things of this world, he's not of God. Go get your eyes on the things of this world. For centuries, the church is preaching that. But in the last 20 years, this prosperity came to America. And we start having more and more things. And begin to, our eyes reach. We're starting to look at Naboth's vineyard. There's something there. He didn't need it. He just wanted it. And it gripped his heart. And so a doctrine comes along that says, I'll get it for you. Are you hearing? Go ahead, clap, be happy. You're the king. I'm going to get your rights for you. And that's the basis, brother, sister, of the doctrine of covetousness that's in the land of America. And I'll look you right in the eye before a holy God. I'll stand before his judgment seat. Released in my heart for telling you from a broken heart. This doctrine of covetousness is Jezebel's doctrine. It's a doctrine that says, I'll get it for you. You see, there was a nagging there. He couldn't do it himself. There's a nagging in the hearts of those who won't lay down their covetousness. They're not willing to suffer for Christ. They're not willing to pay the price. And so... Their doctrine's going to do it for them. So they can go on. You, you just go ahead and eat. You rejoice. You be happy. Stop your head. Sing and shout. You go ahead. I'll do it for you. I'll get it for you. And I want to tell you, it works. It works. Oh, it worked. The greatest deception in the modern church today is this matter of using God's word to put a badge of approval on covetousness. A badge of approval. We have a whole doctrine that's been raised up in these last days to defend covetousness. A whole doctrine in the church. And if you sit there under that, you're becoming blind. Blind. And you know why this gospel's not going to work? Do you know why? Because God is raising up prophets in the land all over the world now saying, enough, enough. Oh, brother, sister, it's coming loud and clear. The, the, the message is coming from everywhere. But your sin has found you out. All right, number three, the Jezebel doctrine hates God's prophets and godly prophecies. Hates it. Talking about the Jezebel doctrine, how Jezebel doctrine hates prophets and godly prophecies. Let me tell you something. Whether Jezebel, when this doctrine has a hold of your heart, nothing can change you. No good report of repentance. No true word of God can change that. You see, the true test, one of the true tests of a false prophet is it'll stand and rail against the true prophets of God. 
he will hear a message that is reproof and he'll call it gloom and doom and he'll say we don't want any of that in this church we will not have it I'm called here just to preach Jesus we just told you that preaching Jesus I showed it to you in the scripture preaching Jesus is preaching godliness it's preaching his holiness and his righteousness giving all to him now Ahab was the man now see Ahab is the victim who are all these people being deceived who are these people giving into covetousness, doctrines of covetousness? Who are these that we're speaking of, bound by the doctrine of Jezebel? Ahab represents the victim, but, but I want you to see something about this man. He did repent at one time. Uh, people who were bound by false doctrines truly at one time had repented. They came through the door of repentance. It's not that they didn't start right. Just like people who come to Times Square Church, or to a church that's preaching holiness and righteousness and it'll deeply affect them it cuts like a knife and they rend their heart they circumcise their ears and they walk for a little while in soft humility before the Lord and this is the tragedy of so many who've repented and they think it's a one-time act it's something you do and then get away from. No, repentance is a walk of holiness. It's not something you do and then pick up something else. Bob and Don and I have been preaching that time after time and time after time. And Ahab would not walk in repentance. And I'll tell you why. Because he'd made a covenant with the world. He'd made a covenant. This is... Uh, I want to show you. I want to show you where Christians are getting off. Here's the first step. You see, they repented, but they wouldn't let go of their covenant with sin. They'd made an agreement before they were saved. There was something that got a hold of their heart, and they suddenly made an agreement with it. It became their lifestyle. They repented, but didn't give up the covenant with sin. People go astray, Christians go astray, because they will not let go of their covenant with sin. Something that's gripped their heart. How many people... How many people we've heard? Oh, brother, preach it. I love that kind of preaching. To Jimmy Swaggart, they write letters saying, Preach it, Jimmy. Oh, they say, I love the word. You can't, can't be too strong for me. Oh, that's, that's the calamity, brother Bob. Somebody saying, I love the truth. When they actually, when they hear it, they chafe under it, they hate it, they grit their teeth, I can't stand this doom and this gloom, I can't stand any more of this reproof, can't take it. Before I ask you how many have loved the truth, didn't I? You raised your hands, you still love it? Yes. Ahab was blind to the fact that he was being directed by lying spirits and not by God. Now, lying spirits are not sent from God, but every spirit evil, every spirit righteous, are at his bidding command. He can chase them from, from human beings. He can command them. He, they are used as his rod. When Ahab went up, and you've got to hear, because here's the foundation of this whole thing. When Ahab went up to Ramoth Gilead, he went up there not thinking, well, now these 400 prophets, the, the, I know that they're not right, and I know that this Micaiah is a man of God, and I should have listened, but I, I, I've got in my heart, I'm going up there, I'm just going to go. He said, these are just bad. No, that's not at all. That's it. Ahab went up fully persuaded, the Bible says. Fully persuaded. He was convinced. He had so turned God off, he was so bound, he'd walked away from his repentance. He had this covetous spirit in him now. I want you to know that those who preach these doctrines of covetousness fully are persuaded in them. All of these doctrines of Jezebel that will not preach against sin, they're fully persuaded that they're preaching love. Why? Because the lying spirit has told them so. And why, why, you say, well, why would God turn anyone? Why would God allow these spirits to come and come to the mouth of the prophets and they would speak this and be so persuaded that even a whole host of their children are persuaded? You say, Brother Wilson, that, that kind of frightens me because could it be possible that I could be deceived before Jesus comes? Is it possible that I could be deceived? Listen, there's a guard against it. There's a way to be absolutely sure you'll never be deceived. Oh, hallelujah. 
You know what it is? It's to come to the light and let Jesus expose every hidden thing and lay it down. And those who lay every sin down, every habit, everything that has taken their heart, every bit of covetousness, and they lay it all down and say, Jesus, you can have it. I'm going all the way with you. Hallelujah. You need never worry about deception. God will bring you holy shepherds. He'll bring you those that will inspire your heart to pray and seek the face of God. You'll leave the house with your heart burning with a holy fire. You'll be in love with Jesus more than you've ever been in love with Him before. The things of this world will go strangely dim in the light of this glory and grace. Here's where the deception is. Here's where, the, here's where people are swallowed up and sell themselves to the devil actually are sold to Satan. God deals with them about their sin, about those things in their life. They won't deal with it. He said, you trust in lying words. Somebody come along and told you that everybody's weak, everybody sins, everybody's doing it. We can't be perfect. If God marked iniquities, who among us could stand? That's only half the story, folks. The Bible said the soul that sinned is it shall die. But you see, this, this leaning, this holding on, this gripping, not willing to lay it down, this covenant with sin, and you begin to trust in these lying words and you continue stealing from God his time. Adultery. Burning incense to, your, incense to your idols. And to me, when the Bible says burning incense, the modern translation is sitting there wasting hours in front of your TV idol. I'm going to say it now. I'm going to say it with love. We're so close to the coming of the Lord. And he's dealing with such awesome unction and power and authority to those who are walking in his spirit. And he's speaking, in fact, when I speak these words to you, now, I feel the holy thunder of, I'm not an Elijah, I'm not a prophet, but I feel the holy thunder of Elijah in my soul. I feel a thunder of God so strong, and I can look some of you right in the eye, and you say you want to go all the way with God, and we talk about television, getting rid of it out of your home, we're not talking about something legalistic, we're not talking about something that has any merit to it, we're talking about tearing down your idols. And I'm telling you now, and I'm going to say it loud and clear, and you're going to stand before the judgment seat of Christ and answer what I tell you right now. And I love you too much. I say that in the authority of God's word. Thou shalt bring no abomination into your house, lest you become a curse just like unto it. You have the eye of the devil himself in your house. You have the eye of Satan. And you say you want to go on with God. No, he said, you're trusting in lying words. You've got a little voice inside saying, I don't see it that way. And that's what it is. I've been delivered to hold on to these things. And then you come to my house. You cover my altar with your tears, yet you hold on to your idolatry. And I'm telling you, God's saying something to his church. He said, you're going to either pay the price or you're going to come to my house and I've been delivered to do all these things. It's okay. That, that's the way you see it, Brother Dave, but I'm not legalistic like that. I'm not preaching legalism. I'm preaching this message that says, if you're going to hold on to those things, you open yourself to deception. Is that about it, Bob? Open yourselves to deception. That's what we've been preaching. No, we're going to come to God's house with an open heart and say, Jesus, if I'm going to give any, I'm going to give it all. I'm not going to hold anything back. And God, by His Spirit, is convicting this body tonight about laying everything down at his feet. And I'm, I'm going to fast, I'm going to pray, and I'm going to seek God, and I know there are others going to join us. We're going to pray until the holy thunder of God comes so strong. I want to hear it. I want to see it. I want to see a people with such hunger. They'll not just say, yes, yes, yes. Amen, amen, amen. But there's a commitment being made when they hear the word of God. I hear it. I receive it. I'll obey it. I'll obey God. Get rid of all the idols. Lay it all down. Don't listen to the gospel of covetousness. Every head bow. Jesus, send the Holy Ghost tonight with convicting power. Come Holy Spirit now and confirm your word, I pray. 
Let no one walk out of this house tonight carrying the idolatry they brought in. Let no one walk out of here tonight clinging to a doctrine, oh God, that would bring spiritual blindness to them. Lord Jesus, we want to lay it all down, every sin.